All right, welcome back everybody. This is the second lecture. We're just uh, uh, getting ready to enter into the new heavens and the new earth. Before we do that, we are trying to answer some questions. So any thoughts on um, why, God, I mean, how Satan could possibly deceive people who've been in the millennium. They've, uh, they've experienced everything and yet they get deceived. How could that happen? Any thoughts, please? Go ahead, um, Divya. Is it a question or is it a comment on uh, an answer? Yeah, I, I was just thinking about that question uh, that you asked, Pastor. I think it's the same way even Adam and Eve were deceived because mm. it was a perfect world, yet they were deceived. Uh, yeah, and as it says in First John 2.16, the lust of the flesh, the pride of eyes, um, mm. pride of life and the lust of the eyes. Maybe, mm. yeah, maybe it could be so. Yeah, Satan might might be using the same tactics. Mm. Very good, very good. You know, so um, this is quite interesting that even though you are in a perfect in environment, doesn't insulate us from deception. Like uh, Devia pointed out, Adam and Eve were in the Garden of Eden. I mean, you, you can't get any more perfect than that. And yet they got deceived. Or to go back, you know, Satan or Lucifer was in the glory of God. He was living in the presence of God, and yet he was he deceived himself, self-deception. So we have these two precedents: Saint Lucifer in the presence of God, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They were deceived. Now, the the the, the, the trick that uh, Satan used in the Garden of Eden is he questioned. You know, did God really say? He questioned, made them question the word of God. And that could very well be his tactic, you know. Get people to doubt everything they've been, the word that they've heard. You know, hey, did Jesus really say there's new heavens and new earth coming? No, that can't be. Did Jesus really say you're going to be part of the new Jerusalem? That can't be. Whatever, you know, he can cause people to doubt the word, just like he caused Adam and Eve. And uh, same thing, you know. I see the other comments. Kennedy says, because people have the free will of choice, exactly. So um, uh, I see Prabhakar's comment, desires of human could be the human desires or something come into play because you hear this thing and then you, the enemy usually targets our desires, okay? But the environment doesn't insulate us from deception. You know, the enemy can bypass that environment and he can make us question the word and that's where deception starts. Um, say your question, please. We can take it up now before we go forward. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, so. I have no issue with Satan deceiving men. I mean, if he could do it in heaven and do it in the Garden of Eden, like we've rightly said, he can do it even in the millennium. Mm. My only contention is who are these who are these people that are being deceived? Because I'm asking myself again, okay, yes, I agree. Anyone could be deceived, but those who have been raptured and will come down to the earth to rule with Christ, they are in a glorified body mm -hmm. that is not corruptible. So I'm wondering, should they still, would they, would they be part of those who will be deceived? Or do we have it? We don't have it. Do we, we, we're not sure or certain, you know, who's going to fall into this category. To an extent, yes, I can believe that those who um, lived in the in the trip in the tribulation period, right, and then entered into the millennium. Yes, I, I can agree on that. But they, some of them, would die, and I believe they will also be resurrected in glorified bodies. So, 
will they still be um, liable to sin even in that glorified state? You know, that, that, that's mm. kind of where my contention is with okay. this. Yeah, yeah, very, very valid question. I think the answer is there in Revelation 20 verse 8, where he says um, that Satan will go to deceive the nations, which are peoples. So um, the people who have already entered into their glorified bodies, they are in their perfect state, so to speak. That means they are they know Christ even as they are known. So they will not uh, you know, necessarily be deceived. Uh, uh, but here he says he goes out to deceive the nations, uh, referring to the peoples who are born during the millennium. Right, because the nations are taught by the saints. Right, so the saints are already saints. The only glorified bodies, they're already ushered into that kingdom. So they are being taught. The saints um, are teaching the nations. So um, I, I don't think, uh, you know, as far as I, I, my persuasion is, I don't think the saints will be will fall for that deception because they are teaching people, they are administering the kingdom. So they're involved in that process. So I don't think they would. Um, and just going by Revelation 20 verse 8, he deceives the nations, meaning he's deceiving the peoples who have you know, not yet um, uh, entered into their glorified body. So that's how I would position it. Um, but I like I see Anita's comment that Adam and Eve were in their glorified state. I mean, they were in a perfect state and yet they were deceived. I mean, that's a valid argument, but uh, my persuasion is that the people who are going to be deceived would be the nations and not the saints. Yeah. Um, although we don't have a, like a chapter and verse to back it up, but I, I feel that would be a, a right uh, understanding. Christopher, your question, please. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, yes, thank you, Pastor. I um, uh, I mean, I think this is, uh, uh, I mean, my, my kind of uh, feel about this attack is that um, um, what, what God has created also, um, even in his image, um, and you know, talking about the angels and um, as well as um, man, uh, mm. the first man. Mm. Um, they have, they have, they are basically comfortable, and uh, they have been, uh, you know, they are, uh, in a sense, um, even though they are in his, in his, in his image, they, mm. they can be comfortable. And um, I'm just thinking that, you know, in the history of uh, you know you know when we see in the old testament and you know even during noah's time when god felt that uh you know it was important in his in his view that that uh, you know the uh, the world could get totally destroyed by the flood except for a few people like noah and his family and in a way this is history repeating itself you know during the uh, in the tribulation and um, bringing the world into a into a state where you know there is even no no devil for one thousand years, and yet man is uh, is is corruptible. Um, so I think fundamentally it's it's about the you know the 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 evil nature of man, even though God created that that you know the, that person. And uh, so that is just one side of it. And then I think the other side of it is that I just feel that, you know, that the love of God is so, is so, is so immense that he has, he's just given us, a, you know, this, in a sense, very simple uh, uh, way to salvation. You know, just accept me. And I will still take you in your corruptible state and, you know, take you to, you know, the, I mean, you will you will live with me in, in heaven. So I I just think that it, even though it is, it stems from this this um, evil nature of of human beings with or without the devil, uh, it's still sort of you know uh, this this life this imperfect kind of life that God has created has 
also given given him that uh, opportunity or given us the opportunity to see that you know that that immense love of god this is a little more an observation rather than a, uh, you know a, a direct answer to your question hmm okay Okay. All right. So you, you're pointing out, first of all, you're pointing out that man is very culpable, you know, and secondly, that God still loves us, uh, even though we are weak. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's fair enough. Uh, but just keep in mind that in Christ, He He's perfecting us, right? In Christ, He's brought us to this spiritually. He's perfect perfected us. And then here on our journey, he is perfecting us. I'm talking about those of us who yield to him, who surrender to him. He's at work in us, perfecting us, right? Okay. Thanks for sharing those thoughts, Christopher. So, you know, so we were just having a little discussion on, on that end, end step where Satan is released for, you know, at the end of the millennium, deceives the nations. He gets convinced, he is able to get a lot of people you know, to join him, he goes on his one final attempt against the city of God, and God intervenes, destroys, uh, you know, uh, uh, fire came down and devoured them, it says, Revelation 20, verse 9, so then Satan is once for all bound, cast into the lake of fire, and then Revelation 20, verses 11 to 15, then there is what we call as the great white throne judgment, a great white throne judgment. This is the last and final judgment. And this is not a judgment of the saints. Okay, so don't confuse the great white throne judgment and the Bema seat judgment. The Bema judgment is the judgment of the saints, that is the of believers, which takes place in heaven. Uh, and it is more of a, 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 a judgment for rewards for believers, right? For the works that they have done in serving God and his kingdom. That's different. That's called Bema Seat Judgment, based on 2 Corinthians chapter 5. But this judgment, Revelation 20, is called the Great White Throne Judgment. It happens at the very end of time. It's like the last thing every human person is going to see. At this Great White Throne Judgment, Revelation 20, 11 to 15, I'm just summarizing it. It says, every person who ever lived will stand before the throne of God. They're already separated, right? That means those who have already believed in Jesus are on one side. So it's not judging them because they're already made their decision to Christ. Then on the other side, you have all those who ever lived of, who did not receive Christ, whose names are not in the book, Lamb's Book of Life. And, uh, you know, the Bible says they were all sent. So death and hell and all people were sent into the lake of fire. Revelation 20, verse 15. So this is the final end. Then what is going to happen, and I'm just going to move a little quickly now, just to finish chapter 21 and 22. We, although the Bible doesn't say it, the... The saints, the believers, those who are saved, are going to be taken out of the earth. And the earth is going to be this renovated or changed with fire. So Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10 to 13, maybe we can read that very quickly. Second um, Peter chapter 3, somebody could read that for us. Second uh, Peter chapter 3. Verses, um, let's turn there. Second Peter chapter 3, um, yeah, verses 10 to 13. Somebody can read that for us, please. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, 
being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat nevertheless we according to his promise look for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells mm. therefore beloved looking forward to these things be diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless okay thank you so think about this peter is telling us what's going to happen this is like the day of the lord this is the last you know there are many days of the lord referenced in scripture uh, like we mentioned in the very beginning the introduction to this course and this day of the lord is the day the final day the great white throne judgment day right after this peter says everything is going to be run away to them melted with fire with great heat so there's going to be new heavens and new earth all everything ever done will be dissolved gone right so noah's time i think somebody mentioned it that was a flood this time everything's going to be dissolved there's going to be new heavens and a new earth now new heavens what does that mean does it mean just the atmospheric heaven surrounding the earth or does it mean the entire universe you know uh, uh, the bible doesn't state very clearly but my persuasion is it just includes everything earth and heavens meaning this entire universe with all its galaxies and billions of stars and everything god's just going to change everything right it's going to make new heavens and a new earth so we're going to be taken out of the way god's going to run away everything and then revelation 21 verse 1 john says now i saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no more sea it's amazing it is it's like a complete change genesis 11 in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth this entire universe with the galaxy stars everything revelation 21:1 and i saw a new heaven and a new earth so my persuasion is that everything genesis 11 talks about has been been brand new by the time we come into revelation 21:1 everything is gone brand new and then he says in this new earth there is the holy city the new jerusalem coming down that means heaven moves to this this uh, new earth that god has created or god brings into being and uh, in this place he describes this in revelation 21 there is no more tears there is no more crying uh, all the former things have passed away revelation 21 verse 4 and he says verse 5 i make all things new and um, it is in this place that we are going to be with the lord forever and ever uh, some of the things and you can read revelation 21 22 some of the things that we can say about this great city uh, is very interestingly uh, you know the 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 you know john uh, interesting thing in the book of revelation is the colors he sees uh, he tries to describe it in terms of the colors of precious stones so he says you know um, the glory of god revelation 21 and uh, the light is like a precious uh, like a most precious stone like jasper and clear as crystal so there is um, the color of jasper and the color uh, clear as crystal so um uh, this is uh, jasper is considered to be a very clear stone so there's this um, bright light but it's so clear it's so 
like there's nothing uh, in it. It's just very clear, nothing uh, dark in it. And then he uh, talks about the gates of the city, remembering the 12 tribes of Israel. So they're going to be remembered throughout. Then he talks about the foundations of the city, the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So the apostles are going to be remembered. And then he describes the city. Um, it's like pure gold, uh, clear as glass. Yeah. In other words, this is something amazing that God puts on the earth, a city that he has built or he puts together. And then he says, you know, this city has no temple. God himself is a temple. This is verse 22 of Revelation 21. Uh, the city has no need for the sun or the moon. So the first heavens and the earth had sun and the moon and the stars. Revelation 21, 1, the new heavens and the new earth doesn't need sun and the moon and the stars because God is the light of everything. So he says in verse 24, Revelation 21, verse 24, the nations, they walk in the light of God. So that means we people, we who have been redeemed, or saints, are, are other nations referred to here, with people from all languages, tribes and tongues, and we are referred to as kings and priests. So we are there in the in the in this new city. And, uh, and then he describes in chapter 22 uh, about a river of life flowing through the city. And uh, uh, you know, we are going to see his face, his name will be on our foreheads. And um, and uh, yeah, he he describes that there's there's that the Lord will reign forever in this city, and we will be with Him forever and ever. Okay, so new heavens and the new earth, a description of this beautiful city, the place where we're going to dwell. Of course, you know John could only write what he was saying. I'm sure there's a whole lot that. He didn't see, he just, just, there's so much more for us in that new heavens, the new earth. And uh, there's no need for the stars. God himself is the light. And there is eternal perpetual life. Uh, we, we, uh, we are there in the city worshiping God, seeing his face, and we will be there forever and ever. So that's how the Bible, you know, transitions out of this present heavens and earth into new heavens and new earth. Okay? So, are you all happy to be in the new heavens and the new earth? We've come to the end of Revelation 22. So we've gone all the way from the rapture of the church, through the tribulation, through the millennium, through the great white throne judgment, and into the new heavens and the new earth. Okay, so that's a chronology of end time events. So what we will do now is I just you know leave this time open for questions and anything that we have discussed so far. Uh, I know I didn't get into the details of uh, chapter and verse. Uh, what we're going to do in our third year is go through Daniel chapter and verse. We're going to go through Revelation chapter and verse. So we will you know read everything and the related scriptures that we were at times cross referencing. So we'll do all that all that you know, in detail. But the, the purpose in this course is to give us a high level overview of the sequence of events. So anything concerning that, please feel free to ask. And the next week, we get into our next chapter, which is the signs of the times. So what are the signs that, that are in the Bible that tell us where we are exactly, or close to where we are, uh, as far as God's calendar uh, of events is concerned. So we will start that next week. Um, let's keep this time for question and answers. Uh, just feel free to ask you um, questions on what we've covered so far. Okay, I have a question for you. Um, the question is, in the millennium, are we going to just be worshipping God, having breakfast, lunch, dinner, and 24-7 worship? 
or will we have work to do? during the millennium. Um, can I answer first? Go ahead, go ahead. Maggie. Uh, the Bible says that we will rule uh, with him. So we'll be working, we'll be uh, involved into in administrations and all other aspects of uh, governing the nation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Good. So you put your hand up. Yes, uh, Pastor. Yes, almost the same thing. And like you rightly said, we'll be teaching um, a lot of those who came out from the tribulation. So there'll be work to do, but not like the work we were doing mm -hmm. in, um, before pre-tribulation. It will not be one that will be um, draining in other words, it's different this time around, you know, because mm. we are in our glorified bodies. And so, yeah, but we will still work. Um, mm. Yes, mm. we will still work. Okay, good. I see all the responses in the chat. So, um, so yeah. Yes, I see all your responses. So everyone agrees. We will have work to do. We will be in charge of the nations. We're ruling with Christ. Kennedy says, too much work. Uh, we even have to work double time in <laughs> process. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, so good. You know, in Isaiah 65, you read, you know, it says, uh, we will enjoy the work of our hands, right? So we have work to do, but uh, it's not, um, you know, like say you were saying, uh, a work that is going to trouble us, it's going to be work that we will enjoy, okay? So, uh, you know, God is preparing us for that now. I want you to think about this. Um, if you go with me to Revelation, uh, not Revelation, Luke 19, please. Um, Luke 19. And uh, let me give you the exact verse. It's around 16, 17. Okay. Um, um, Luke, Luke 19. Can somebody read 16 and 17, please? Luke chapter 19, verses 16 and 17. Somebody can read it. Then came the first saying, Master, your mina has earned 10 minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in very little, have authority over 10 cities. Hmm. So, how would you interpret this? I mean, I know we just read two verses from the whole story, from the whole parable. Um, but how would you interpret this? Anybody? I mean, you can read that if you want. You can keep the whole story in mind, whole parable in mind. So, mm -hmm. are we are we okay to say to say to say that this this parable is speaks about um, the reward that God uh, the Lord will give those who who work hard, those who use their their talent for the kingdom, and then they'll mm -hmm. be rewarded when he comes he comes back in his kingdom. So, so anyone who who labored hard and produced more fruits will, will be given a reward according to what they did on earth. Mm -hmm. yes. And what would the reward be according to this? Uh, what? A rulership of cities and mm -hmm. towns and mm -hmm. watch over people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thank you, Maggie. So... In Luke 19, this same parable, it seems to indicate to us that um, if you serve the Lord faithfully in this life, uh, he will then give us yes, some sort of responsibility in that coming kingdom uh, to administer that kingdom. Yeah. 
uh, over cities and so on. So that response, there seems to be a connection between now and the next. Um, go ahead, say. So um, sometimes we kind of use that scripture to talk about the righteous and those who who never accepted Jesus Christ. But it seems now we're looking at it more in rewards for those who say served faithfully to rule during the time of the millennium. So my, my question is, um, where does this parable fit really? Uh, because he now talks about the unfaithful servant who did not use his gift and then was thrown into jail sometimes we hear people say oh those are people who will be thrown into hell or is that just symbolic of something else you know just more clarity on on that mm, mm, mm. yeah so we so um so in in in, in you know in interpreting parables about the kingdom. So what the Lord is, he's using stories from our world to give us insight into the things of the kingdom. Uh, but we shouldn't, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, draw comparisons for everything in the story. Right? We go with the, the main truth that the story brings out for us, uh, but we don't have to necessarily take every detail because the parables are just stories, illustrations from our world. The main intent of the parable is what we must pursue. So the main intent of the parable is this, you know, your faithfulness in this life to the Lord and to what he has given you, that you're a good steward of it, you're a faithful and good steward, uh, then he rewards you in his coming kingdom. That's the main story. Now, in the natural, uh, the, as the story is narrated, of course, there is punishment to the servant who is not faithful with what he has been entrusted. So how do we interpret that? Well, we have to understand what the New Testament teaches. You know? So that is uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, that if you are a believer and your works are burned up, that means you don't have any works to show you're still going to be saved, right? You're not going to be thrown into outer darkness just because you didn't have any works to show. So Paul makes it very clear, right? In 1 Corinthians 3, he says, our works will be tested with fire. Of what sort it is, wood, hay, or stubble, or gold, silver, precious stones. But if our works are burned up, uh, we have suffered loss. That means there's no reward. But we ourselves will be saved. So that's how we will you know, interpret this whole thing. We shouldn't get into the details of the parable where, you know, the man is thrown out um, because then we could go and we can take many parables and go off in wrong directions. So we interpret the parables. The main message, the rest of it is in the light of the rest of the New Testament teaching. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, um, um, Divya, the parable of sheep and goats. Uh, what does it point to in the end time judgments of God? So uh, Matthew 25, which is the separation of the sheep and the goats. Uh, uh, what I did mention is most people uh, position this, Matthew 25, at the end of the tribulation. I wouldn't say most people, some people, right? Some people position Matthew 25 at the end of the tribulation. Some people position Matthew 25 at the end of the millennium. Right? So there is this, you know, uh, I would say uh, difference, variation. Um, some people you'll find that they would say Matthew 25 takes place at the end of the tribulation, when the Lord separates the sheep and the goats, and he dismisses the wicked out into hell and 
the sheep are allowed to go into the millennium. That's one. Some people do that. Some people do it at the great white throne judgment where they already separated the sheep and the goats are separated. And it's the last and final judgment. And there's nothing more after that. So um, there is resemblance, I mean, in both cases, in both situations. Uh, but uh, to me, you know, the great white throne judgment seems to be the grand finale. It's the last, it's the end. And so uh, Matthew 25 seems to be positioned there. And I, I'm okay with both positionings. I'm not hard and fast on it, but uh, maybe Matthew 25 uh, seems to fit more with the grand finale, the great white throne judgment. But you will find that sometimes people position it at the end of the tribulation where people are separated as well. Okay. Yeah, so uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, refers to the millennium where the saints are judging, ruling the world. Okay. All right, I see several hands up. Let's go one by one. Um, uh, let me see who, okay, Maggie, Christopher, and say, please, uh, Maggie. Thank you, sir. Um, I have a question. Um, it's from uh, chapter 20, uh, the thousand he years reign of Christ. Mm -hmm. from, from verse 4 to verse 6, uh, mm -hmm. it says that when the throne came down, those who, who did not worship the image of, 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 uh, of the beast or had the mark of, mark, mark of the beast and those who were killed for the sake of Christ will be raised up and reign with Christ for a thousand years. Mm. For a thousand years. And the rest of the dead did not come to life until the end of that period. So my question is, what happened to those who died before the tribulation? Like for us now, when we pass, we pass on, or what mm -hmm. would happen to us? Are we also, will you also reign with Christ, or are we, will, are we staying in heaven and then come afterward, after the battle of Magog and Gog and Magog? Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir. Yeah, so uh, we have been raised up, uh, you know, at the resurrected, we get our resurrected bodies, at the rapture of the church before the tribulation, we come with Christ. So Revelation 19, the armies in heaven. And if you look at Jude chapter one, and there's only one chapter, um, verse, somebody could read verse 14 and 15, please. Jude 1, 14 and 15. Jude 1, 14 and 15. Now Enoch, the seventh from the Adam, prophesied about these men also saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all, their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Mm. So when the Lord, thank you, thank you. So when the Lord comes, who comes with him? Ten thousands of his saints. So we'll be there, right? We'll be coming with the Lord. So this is parallel to Revelation 19, 14. It says the armies in heaven clothed and find and white and clean, followed him on white horses. Who are the armies of heaven? Jude 1, 14 says, he says, oh, ten thousands of his saints are coming with him. So we are coming with him, right? And then Daniel chapter 7, um, um, yeah, let's take time to read it. Daniel 7, uh, and it's, uh, you know, uh, Daniel 7, and let's us read verse 27, please. Daniel seven twenty-seven. somebody could read that. Daniel seven twenty-seven.
and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the world heaven shall be given to people of the saints of the most high his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall save and obey him mm. so um you can look up other, I mean, this whole chapter, but it's talking about how the kingdom will be given to the, um, the, the, the Son of Man, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, and to the saints, and they will reign with him. Okay? So to answer your question, uh, in Revelation 19, 14, the saints, thousands and thousands of them are coming with the Lord in the armies of heaven. These are saints who have already been resurrected before in the tribulation, uh, before the tribulation in the rapture. They're coming with the Lord as the armies of heaven and they will be part of that conquering army that destroys, you know, the, the, uh, in the battle of Armageddon, destroys the armies of the earth. So they are there with the Lord. They've come with the Lord. Those have died before the tribulation and who have received glorified bodies. And then those who have died during the tribulation are also resurrected, right? And then all of us together reign on the earth. And this is again corroborated by 1 Corinthians 6 verse 2 with Brother Manoj shared that he, Paul writes here, don't you know that we will judge the angels, that we will judge the world. So believers, all believers will be involved in the millennial reign of Christ, based on Daniel 7, 27, Jude 1, 14, uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 2 and verse 4. Okay. All right. Uh, is answer your question, Maggie? You okay? Yes, sir. Thank, okay. you. Thank you very much. Sir. You're welcome. Now, let's take the other two. Say E and Christopher, please. Yes, Pastor. I, I was just going to um, maybe um, um, just you, the passage you read, Matthew 25, where you talked about Jesus separating the sheep and the goats. Could it also just be like a general template of what he's just going to do pertaining to we as believers and those who receive Jesus, those who rapture, and not necessarily a particular time? And I, I don't know, just another way, I just want to look at it might not really just be like a particular time that that parable was fixed to, but just giving us a sense of God's righteous judgment in ensuring that all the righteous will be rewarded and will live with him. And then for those who live wickedly and refuse to accept him, they will be separated. I don't know if that also goes. Yeah, I think that's fair, fair to do that. Uh, not to necessarily position it at a particular point in time, but a general understanding of how, you know, who enters the kingdom and who do not enter the kingdom. And Jesus said, you know, as much as you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you do it to me, you come into the kingdom. So that's fair enough. It's fair to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Christopher, your question, please. Yeah, my question, Pastor, is um, actually going back <laughs> uh, to something that uh, you had already gone through earlier, which is basically the the, the message that God had uh, you know, with the seven churches. And uh, uh, there are some who who, who say that uh, uh, these churches are, in a sense, linked uh, and, and can be attributed to the church history. So just want to understand, uh, is this valid? And uh, I just put, um, you know, some of those dates um, actually in the, in the comment. Um, so, uh, so for, for example, if he says, uh, you know, 33, uh, and that, that those particular miles and those particular start date and end date would be 33 would be when, when Jesus actually got, uh, you know, ascended uh, to heaven. And then 100 would actually would kind of put into, you know, uh, the, the passing away of of John, uh, you know, the last uh, last uh, the apostle mm. of, of Jesus, and similarly, all the other ones, uh, you know, mm. uh, the next one would be, um, uh, you know, that Smyrna, which is you know, yeah. taking from hundred to three one two. Three one two is when uh, when King uh, 
uh, Constantine actually uh, sort of elevated the um, Christians and he, he himself converted to Christianity and in a sense also forced people to become Christians. Um, yes, yeah, so, so my, my, my I think there's one point with regards to Philadelphia and uh, Laodicea, which says that, you know, there's kind mm. of like two diverge, divergent parts, which Philadelphia sort of took the, the, you know, the, the, the correct part. And that's why they are, they are led to, you know, to the rapture. And Laodicea was sort of, you know, um, uh, they did not, they, they, they sort of were more into a, a liberal sort of aspect. And that explains why some churches have actually strayed from, you know, the, um, the fundamental uh, way of, uh, I mean, fundamental truths that, um, that are from the Bible. So I just wanted to understand, is this valid? And um, something that I've, I've, I've actually just um, gone through recently in some mm. presentations, I just want to understand if it is valid. Yeah, so people have been doing this for a long time, you know, doing this, but I think um, we just have to go with what the Lord Jesus said. You know, I mean, if we honor him and honor his word, we should stay with, with what he said. And what did he say? He said, these things, these are things that are, uh, which is referring to, you know, chapters two and three. And then when he begins chapter four, that's when the Lord says, I'm going to show you things which are yet to come. So chapters two and three, very clearly, these are the words of Jesus, right? So very clearly, chapters two and three deal with things which are. And chapter four, verse one starts about things which are yet to come. So definitely, based on what Jesus said, chapters two and three do not deal with things that are yet to come. So when somebody starts putting these dates, they are actually contradicting Jesus. First thing. They are doing something Jesus didn't intend in his spoken words, right? Because they're outrightly violating Revelation 4.1. Um, they are pushing Revelation 2 and 3 into the future, which Jesus never intended. On the contrary, I think the right approach is to say that, yeah, they, Jesus was speaking. There were hundreds of churches at that time, around 80, 98, when Jesus approximately, when the Lord was speaking to John. There were hundreds of churches, and out of that, he is speaking to seven churches, seven specific churches, giving them a message, uh, which is a learning for all of us. And the only thing that's positioned in the future in each of these seven churches is the promise to the overcomer, right? To each of these seven churches, you know, if you overcome, this is your reward. And the reward is always out in the future. You know, you will sit with me on my throne or you will, you know, I will clothe you in white raiment and so on and so forth. So the promise, the reward for the overcomers out in the future, but the seven churches were there literally. And Jesus himself said, John, I'm speaking to you about things which you've seen, things which are, and things which are yet to come. And Jesus clearly states Revelation 4.1 about things which are yet to come. So my, personally, I, you know, I've, I've, I've heard about these things, but I do not subscribe to it personally. What I would say is that we should learn from all seven churches. And uh, doing something like this is actually just, you know, going against what Jesus said there, Revelation 4.1. It's my, you know, my, persuasion on that but you know there are many respected people who do this and um, yeah if they want to do it it's okay it's up to them yeah all right thank you everyone for the questions and time of interaction appreciate that we're going to close in prayer and uh, so next week we will move into the next chapter which is the signs of the times. Uh, so I'll give you a new PDF for that. And we just go through, you know, various signs um, that, um, that indicate to us where we are. And uh, yeah, so that will be our last uh, segment. And then we'll close up after that. Okay, can somebody lead us in prayer, please? And then we will dismiss. Let us pray. 
Our Father in heaven, we bless you. We thank you for the times, we, the time, Lord, we spent, Lord, um, learning about what is to come. Mm. Thank you for how far you've taken us, Lord, in the wisdom that has been dispensed through your Son. Pray, Lord, you replenish him and you strengthen him. And the wisdom, Lord, to continue this work, Lord, you will continue to pour out more on him. For us, Lord, who are students who have been learning, Lord, we pray. Lord, you will equip us more and more, Lord, to be good teachers to the body, Lord, to all the people you would bring our way. That, Lord, we'll be able to decipher and explain any complexities surrounding the end of times, surrounding the book of Revelation. Lord, help us, Lord, by your spirit, Lord, to be good teachers of your word to your people. And, Lord, to unfold the mysteries, O oh God, that people, Lord, do not know and are confused about. As we continue, Lord, we pray, Lord, pour more of your wisdom, Lord, for us to understand, Lord, and to be prepared, Lord, to live each day, Lord, ready for your coming. We pray, O oh Lord, that for us, all of us, Lord, we will rule with you in the millennium to come. And at the end, above all, we will reign forever with you. Thank you, everlasting Father. As we go about our duties today, wherever we are in any country, Lord, be with us, protect us from the evil one, keep us and preserve us. Thank you, everlasting Father, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Pastor. Everyone. Enjoy. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you all tomorrow. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. God bless. God bless. See you tomorrow. God bless. Thank you.